hello good morning <laughs> what time is it okay it's like half ten and um, I am feeling very full of energy um, and a bit bored but sort of in a good way it's making me do a lot of stuff um, I hope that you guys are doing all right today um, I feel like it's been maybe a week since I did the last reading. Um, something like that, it's been busy. I've been away for the weekend, so I've had lots of fun. <laughs> and um, yeah, I was just sitting down to read my lovely book, On the Path to Enlightenment by Mathieu Ricard. Um, and I thought, hey, I'm gonna read. Why don't I read with you guys as usual? Um, so I'm not, <clears throat> Not missing out too much. Uh, we did chapter five and we are on to chapter six. And I've read, oh no, chapter six I've done, but this is chapter seven, altruistic love and compassion, which I think is quite a nice one because a lot of this book, if you've seen my other videos, um, you know, these Buddhist monks are talking about um, how to practice the Dharma, uh, Buddhism, and it's, it, I've been quite surprised, I guess, at how much emptiness there is. Um, and it feels a bit bleak. And so when I got to this chapter, I couldn't, I, did, I didn't wait to do a reading. I just wanted to read it because it was sort of like relief. So um, I've read a bit of it already. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the beginning, read like the first little section, and then I'm going to go to where I left off. Um, there's still quite a lot to read. So you'll get a good chunk. Okay, so altruistic love and compassion. Altruistic love and compassion are the heart of Buddhist practice. They are considered to be the essence of the great vehicle, the path traveled by all the Buddhas of past and present, and which will be traveled by all the Buddhas of the future. The method, which alone is sufficient and without which nothing can be accomplished. In the Buddhist sense, altruistic love is defined as the wish that all beings may find happiness and the causes of happiness, and compassion as the wish that all beings may be free from suffering and the causes of suffering. These two can be summed up as unconditional kindness toward all beings in general that is ready to manifest at all times toward any individual in particular. It is a way of being in the world for others that is cultivated until it permeates one's entire being. It does not mean catering to the wishes and whims of others without discrimination, and it certainly does not mean wishing success to those who pursue harmful goals. We should take into account the different elements of each situation and ask, for example, what are the consequences, both short and long term? What will really be the good of this or that person? or if an action will help a small number of individuals or a large number. Love and compassion must be informed by wisdom. Oh, itchy nerd. This is based on understanding the immediate and ultimate causes of suffering. By suffering, we mean not just the obvious sufferings of which we are so often the victims or witnesses, such as disease, war, famine, injustice and poverty, but also their deep causes, namely the mental poisons. As long as our mind is clouded by confusion, hatred, attachment, jealousy and arrogance, suffering in all its forms will always manifest. Buddhism teaches that the source of these mental poisons is ignorance of the nature of beings and things, which creates a gulf between our perceptions and reality. We take as permanent what is impermanent, what we take as happiness is often only a cause of suffering, for instance, wealth, power, fame and fleeting pleasures. Things appear to us as inherently pleasant or unpleasant and beings as inherently good or bad. The I that perceives them seems equally real and concrete. This mistake leads to powerful reflexes of attachment and aversion that inevitably lead to suffering. Our love and compassion take on a new dimension when we, when we understand that suffering is not inevitable and it is possible to stop the suffering of beings. 
In his first teaching at the Deer Park near Benares, the Buddha expounded the Four Noble Truths, the truth of suffering, which must be understood, the truth of the causes of suffering, ignorance and the negative mental states that ignorance breeds, which must be eliminated, the truth of the cessation of suffering, which we must attain, and the truth of the path, which must be followed in order to end suffering. When combined with joy at the qualities and successes of others and impartiality toward all beings, love and compassion are the basis of the mind of enlightenment, or bodhicitta, defined as the wish to attain Buddhahood in order to liberate all beings from suffering and its causes. This desire must be accompanied by a determination to do everything in one's power to remedy suffering, not just for a limited time, but for as long as there are beings and those beings continue to suffer. How can we cultivate love and compassion? The first step is to realise that deep down we want to be happy and want, not, and want not to suffer, and that it is the same for all beings, including animals. This right not to suffer, so often disregarded, is perhaps the most fundamental of all. Buddhist compassion ideally aims to put an end to all suffering, whatever it might be and whoever it affects. It is not based on any moral judgment and does not depend on how others behave. It is not limited to our loved ones or those who treat us favourably, but embraces all beings without exception, be they friends, enemies or strangers. So that is sort of the introduction to uh, this chapter on love and compassion. Um, I really like it. I mean, obviously we all hopefully like a bit of love and compassion, but it's um, after the chapters of letting go of everything and, and, you know, not being attached to anything and everything that we live with being um, an, an illusion and not real. It's quite nice to have something that here where they're talking about doing something and something meaning something to them. So it's nice. I like it. <laughs> so I read, I read some stuff after that. Let me see if there's any titles that are interesting. To sort of guide us through it. Cultivating compassion, how we cultivate compassion. So they have a love and compassion uh, meditation where you, you start with them um, wishing the best and wishing love and everything to people that you know, that you really care about. And then you go further to people that you don't know. Uh, maybe if you live in London, you do all the people of London, you know, and then you do everyone in England. And then gradually you, you start thinking about people that maybe you're not so keen on and wishing them love, compassion at the end of suffering, all that jazz. Um, and then maybe you get to people that you think are terrible uh, and then you know you're sort of at that state where you have this abundant love and compassion for all beings um, so yeah so cultivating that compassion uh, through meditation so you have to look that bit up yourself because I've already read that bit but anyway <laughs> I got to this this morning um, the alchemy of suffering, which I got really excited about. The alchemy of suffering. Alchemy being magic and transformation. Um, so I thought, hey, that sounds purposeful and full of action. Let's see what that's about. <laughs> so, um, as ever, these, these chapters are full of quotes by Buddhist monks. Please bear with me with my pronunciation. I try my best. <clears throat> anyway, this is by Diljo Kiense Rinpoche, The Alchemy of Suffering. By sincerely training in the meditation practice of exchanging suffering for happiness, you will eventually become capable of actually taking on others' illnesses and curing them and giving them your happiness in reality. Moreover, those with harmful intentions, even evil spirits who try to steal people's life force, will be powerless to harm either you or anyone else if you exchange their suffering and hatred with your happiness and peace. There are some extraordinary pith instruction. It might be pie instructions. Maybe with pie, that sounds better than pith. 
sorry if I'm wrong. There are some extraordinary pied instructions that explain in more detail how to make this practice more effective. First, it is important to start by arousing a deeply felt warmth, sensitivity and compassion for all beings. To do so, begin by thinking about someone who has been very kind and loving to you. In most cases, this could be your own mother. Remember and reflect on her kindness, how she gave you life, how she suffered the discomforts of pregnancy and the pain of childbirth, how she looked after you as you grew up, sparing no effort. She was ready to make any sacrifice for you and to put your welfare before her own. When you feel strong love and compassion, imagine that she is undergoing terrible sufferings, that she suffers in agony before your very eyes, being dragged along the ground or tortured. Then imagine that she is starving, just skin and bones. She stretches her hands out to you, imploring you, my child, do you have anything you can give me to eat? Imagine her reborn as an animal, a terrified doe being chased by hunters and their dogs. In panic, she leaps off a high cliff to escape them, but falls with unbearable pain, shattering all her bones. Still alive, but unable to move, she is finished off by the hunter's knives. Continue to imagine your mother, or another person that you have taken as the object of your meditation, undergoing situation after situation of suffering. An intense feeling of compassion will irresistibly well up in your mind. At that moment, turn that intense compassion to all beings, realising that each one of them must surely have been your mother many times and deserves the same love and compassion as your mother of this present life. It is important to include all those whom you now consider to be enemies or troublemakers. Reflect deeply about everything that all these beings are going through as they wander endlessly in samsara's vicious cycle of suffering. Think about old, infirm people unable to care for themselves, about all those who are sick and in pain, people who are desperate and impoverished, lacking even the most basic necessities, about people suffering famine and starvation, the pangs of hunger and thirst, those who are physically blind, and about those who are spiritually destitute starved of the nourishment of dharma and blind to any authentic vision of truth. Think about all those who suffer as slaves to their own minds, constantly maddened by desire and aggression, and about those who harm one another without respite. Visualise all these sentient beings as a crowd in front of you and let all the different forms that their suffering takes arise vividly in your mind. With an intense feeling of compassion, begin the practice of exchange. Think of all those who suffer and consider that as your breath goes out, all your happiness, all your vitality, merit, good fortune, health and enjoyment is carried out to them on your breath in the form of cool, soothing, luminous white nectar. Make the following prayer. May this truly go to my enemy and be entirely given to him. Visualise that they absorb this white nectar, which provides them with everything that they need. If their lives were to be short, imagine that now they are prolonged. If they need money, imagine that now they are wealthy. If they are sick, that they now are cured. And if they are unhappy, now imagine them so full of joy that they feel like singing and dancing. As you breathe in, consider that you take into yourself in the form of a dark mass all the sickness, obscurations and mental poisons of others, and that they are thereby completely relieved of all their afflictions. Think that their sufferings come to you as easily as mountain mist wafted away by the wind. As you take their suffering into you, you feel great joy and bliss mingled with the experience of emptiness. Repeat this again and again until it becomes second nature to you. This precious, vital practice can be practiced both in and out of meditation sessions. You can use it at any time and in all circumstances, while engaged in the activities of ordinary life, whether you are sick or well. Sometimes, visualise that your heart is a brilliant ball of light. As you breathe out, 
It radiates rays of white light in all directions, carrying your happiness to all beings. As you breathe in, their suffering, negativity and afflictions come toward you in the form of dense black light, which is absorbed into your heart and disappears in its brilliant white light without a trace, relieving all beings of their pain and sorrow. Sometimes, visualise yourself transformed into a wish-fulfilling jewel, radiant and blue like a sapphire, a little larger than your own body, on top of a victory banner. The jewel effortlessly fulfills the needs and aspirations of whoever addresses, addresses a prayer to it. Sometimes, visualise that your body multiplies into infinite forms of yourself, which travel throughout the universe, immediately taking on all the sufferings of each and every being they encounter and giving away all your happiness to them. Sometimes, visualise that your body transforms into clothes for all those who are cold and need clothing, into food for all those who are hungry, and into shelter for all who are homeless. The exchange of self and others can also be used as a way of dealing with the negative emotions that cause us so much suffering. You can practice using any one of them, for instance, desire. Desire is the compulsive attraction and attachment we feel toward a person or an object. Start by considering that if you tame your own desire, you will be able to reach enlightenment in order to help, to best help beings and to establish them all in Buddhahood. Then think about someone you do not like. Arousing great compassion for that person, add all his desires to your own and think that as you take them, he becomes free of them. Progressively take all beings' desires, whether manifest or latent, upon yourself and as you do so, think that all beings become free from desire and achieve enlightenment. This is the way to meditate on taking negative emotions according to relative truth. To meditate according to absolute truth, arouse in yourself an overwhelming feeling of desire. Fuel it by adding the desires of all beings to make a great mountain of desire. Then look right into it. You will see that desire is nothing but thoughts. It appears in your mind, but does not itself have even the tiniest particle of independent existence. And when you turn the mind inward to look, at, to look at yourself, you become aware that the mind, too, is without any inherent existence in either past, present or future. The nature of the mind is as insubstantial as the sky. Using these same methods, you can meditate on anger, pride, jealousy and ignorance, as well as on anything else that obscures the mind. Of all the practices of the bodhisattvas, this is the most essential. There is no obstacle that can disrupt it. Not only will it help others, but it will bring you to enlightenment too. As a beginner, you may not be able to help beings outwardly very much, but you should meditate constantly on love and compassion until your whole being is imbued with them. That was a step-by-step -step on how to meditate on compassion. Okay, uh, this is Galsi Thongmi. Uh, this is an excerpt from the biography of Galsi Thongmi by Paldin Yeshe. A life of compassion. Once, when Galsi Thongmi was 16, a benefactor of the monastery asked him to leave for Sakya on an important task and to return the next day. Halfway to Sakya, in a desert plain, the young Thogmi came upon a bitch who was starving to death. She was on the verge of eating her own pups. He felt great pity for her and wondered what he could do to help, decided to carry them all back to E, his monastery. He would then have to travel all night to make up for the time lost. He set off, carrying the dogs on his back. It was very hard. Finally, however, he arrived back at E and finished taking care of them. Before setting off again, he thought he had better have a sip of water. It was then that he came upon the man who had sent him on his errand. 
Astonished at seeing him there, the man asked, Hey, didn't you go? When Thogmi explained what had happened, the man cursed him and said, There's such important business at stake, and here you are with your great compassion. Thogmi had been rebuked so sternly that he did not dare take his sip of water. He set off again at once, walked all night, and accomplished his task at Sakya early in the morning. Returning immediately, he arrived back at E just before sunset. Seeing this, the man who had sent him was amazed. He begged Thogmi to forgive him for the scolding he had given him. He added, What you did is wondrous indeed. Another time, when he was about twenty, all the monks of E were leaving for Chobar when Thogmi saw a crippled woman weeping by the main door of the monastery. He asked her what was wrong. She explained that she was crying because the monks were leaving. As she would be left behind, there would be no one left to give her alms. Thogmi told her not to despair. He would return to fetch her, he promised. He carried his belongings up to Shobar and rested for a short while before leaving again with a rope. His friends called him from afar, asking where he was going. Thogmi said that he was going back to get the crippled woman, but they did not believe him. When he got back to E, however, he found that he could not carry both the woman and her things. So first he carried her clothes and a mat a certain distance, and then came back to carry the woman. In this way, carrying in turn the woman and her belongings, he eventually reached Shobar. His friends were astonished. They had thought at first that he had just gone to collect firewood. When Gaussi Thogmi was about 30, a sick beggar used to stay outside near his door. His body was completely infested with lice. Thogmi used to give him whatever food and drink he had, bringing it to him discreetly at night to avoid making a show of his generosity. But one night the beggar was not in his usual place, and Thogmi set out in search of him. Finding him at last as dawn broke, Thogmi asked him why he'd gone away. Some people told me I was so disgusting that when they walked by, they could not even look at me, and they kicked me out, said the beggar. Hearing this, Thogmi was overwhelmed by compassion and wept. That evening he brought the beggar to his room and gave the man his fill of food and drink. Then Thogmi gave him his own new robes, taking in exchange the beggar's rags. Thogmi put them on and let the lice feed on his body. It was not long before he looked as though he had been stricken by leprosy or some other disease. He was so weakened and, and disabled by sickness that he had to stop teaching. His friends and disciples came to see him, wondering whether he had fallen seriously ill. They soon saw the condition he was in. Why don't you be a good practitioner again? They admonished him. Some quoted from the scriptures, if your compassion is not totally pure, do not give your body away. Others begged him, for your sake and ours, don't carry on like this, get rid of those lice. But Thogmi said, since time without beginning, I have had so many human lives, but they have all been in vain. Now, even if I die today, I will at least have done something meaningful. I will not get rid of the lice. He kept feeding the lice for 17 days, but they gradually died by themselves and he was free of them. He recited many mantras over the dead lice and made sarsars with them. Sarsars, small sculptures in the form of a stupa symbolizing the Buddha's enlightened mind, usually made of clay. Everyone now marveled at the purity of his mind and his loving kindness, and everywhere he became known as Gyalsi Shenpo, the great Bodhisattva. Bo I can't say this word. Bodhisattva. It's not going to be the right way of pronouncing that. His compassion was so strong that he was able to help and transform not only human beings, but animals too. Mutual enemies, such as wolves and sheep and deer, forgot their cruelty and their fear. They would play peacefully together in his presence and listen with respect to his teachings. Once, a hermit meditating on the inner channels and energies encountered obstacles to his practice. Losing control of his mind, he began to run about naked. A female wild sheep came upon him. She circled him, threatening to butt him with her horns. When, she, when, the, when the hermit saw this, he recovered his self-control and realised what had befallen him. Hearing of the incident, Thogmi teasingly said that this sheep was an expert in dispelling the obstacles of great meditators. When Thogmi became sick, the same sheep showed many signs of distress. 
Three days after his passing, she suddenly died also below Ogmi's hermitage. He was so serene, self-controlled and kind that whoever stayed near him naturally became detached from worldly concerns, and then came the last months of his life. He first showed signs of sickness to encourage his disciples to be diligent by making them feel sad and to show how sickness can be used on the spiritual path. He said that no treatment was likely to help, but to calm everyone, he took some medicine nonetheless and let prayers and ceremonies be performed on his behalf. When someone asked him if there were any way to prolong his life, Thogmi said, if my being sick will benefit beings, may I be blessed with sickness. If my dying will benefit beings, may I be blessed with death. If my being well will benefit beings, may I be blessed with recovery. This is the prayer I make to the three jewels. Having complete certainty that whatever happens is the blessing of the three jewels, I am happy, and I shall take whatever happens onto the path without trying to change anything. His close disciples begged him to consider whether medical treatment or anything else they could offer him would be of any benefit. But Thogmi said, I have reached the limit of my years and my sickness is severe. Even the attentions of highly skilled physicians with ambrosia-like medicine would be unlikely to help much. And he added, If this illusory body, which I cling to as mine, is sick, let it be sick. This sickness enables me to exhaust the bad karma I have accumulated in the past, and the spiritual deeds I can then perform help me purify the two kinds of veils. The two veils, the obscuration of the negative emotions and the cognitive obscurations. If I am good in health, I am happy, because when my body and mind are well, I can enhance my spiritual practice and give real meaning to human existence by turning my body speech and mind to virtue. If I am poor, I am happy, because I've no wealth to protect, and I know that all feuds and animosities sprout from the seeds of greed and attachment. If I am rich, I am happy, because with my wealth I can do more positive actions, and both temporal and ultimate happiness are the result of meritorious deeds. If I die soon, that's excellent, because, assisted by some good potential, I am confident that I shall enter the unmistaken path before any obstacle can intervene. If I live long, I am happy, because without parting from the warm, beneficial reign of spiritual instructions, I can, over a long time, fully ripen the crop of inner experiences. Therefore, whatever happens, I shall be happy. And he continued, I've been teaching these five instructions to others, and I must practice them myself. As it is said, what is called sickness has no true existence whatsoever, but appears within the display of illusory phenomena as the ine ineluctable result of wrong actions. Sickness is the teacher that points out the nature of samsara and shows us that phenomena, manifest though they may, have no more true existence than an, than an illusion. Sickness provides us with the grounds for developing patience toward our own suffering and compassion for the suffering of others. It is in such difficult circumstances that our spiritual practice is put to the test. If I die, I'll be relieved of the pains of my sickness. I can't recall any task that I've left undone, and what's more, I realise how rare an opportunity it is to be able to die as the perfect conclusion of my spiritual practice. That's why I'm not hoping for any cure for my illness. Nevertheless, before I die, you may complete all your ceremonies. End of chapter seven. Um, thank you so much for listening and tuning in. I didn't really see that ending coming there. <laughs> that often happens to me. Suddenly it's the end. Um, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, i trying to think. I, mean, I suppose that's right if we're really ill. Any, any suffering, um, I guess, helps us to 
grow our compassion for others. If we suffer, we know what it's like to suffer. And so when we see other people suffering, we feel for them more. Yeah. Um, cool. I'm going to go. I, I, I want to find the a love and compassion meditation and uh, do that with you guys at some point. Um, but for now... Oh, we can just make one up for now, can't we? If you want to, just find a comfortable spot. Um, whether you're lying down or sitting like me, wherever you are, if you're sitting, roll your shoulders back. Make sure that your spine is nice and long. Do that if you're lying down too. And if you're lying down, maybe bend your knees, put your feet flat on the, the bed or ground so that your knees are up. Lengthen out your spine, that's called semi-supine. It's uh, good. And if you're sat up, just imagine that string pulling you up to the sky. a couple of nice big clearing breaths so in through the nose out through the mouth again one more Keep breathing through the nose, in through the nose, out through the nose. And when you breathe in, let your tummy go. Like a balloon that's filling up. Now, let's think of someone, let's think of someone that we love a lot. It can be your mum or dad, it can be your sibling, it can be a friend, it can be a pet. Let's go across all species. Think of a being that you love a lot. See them. What they look like. Maybe what they sound like. What do they sound like when they laugh? Or if it's an animal that you love, what, what sound do they make when they're happy or maybe when they want your, your attention? And as the book did, we can imagine that being in pain. Something's happened to them, something pretty bad. Imagine how that would make you feel. The love that you have, the desire to care for them, the desire to see them better and happy again. And now, very quickly, without thinking too much, think of someone that you do not like, whether you know them or not. Someone that you do not have many good feelings for at all. An enemy, perhaps. Or someone that you think is doing harm in the world. And those feelings of love and compassion that we just built for that person that we knew or that being that we knew are going to turn them now instantly onto that person that we do not like and wish them well. 
wish them peace and the end of their suffering. And if this compassion and this love in your heart is the sort of golden light, imagine that now traveling really fast out of your heart and going to that person, that going into their heart. And in return, that black light from that person, the suffering, the mental poisons going on with that being, come to you. They come into your heart and they are changed into that golden white light. No trace of it left. And when you're ready, just do what you want to do to wake your body up, to maybe blink your eyes open very slowly, very gently, back into the room. It was very quick, but um, we were just sort of making it up as we go along, and it's nice to give something like that a go. Um, if you've never meditated before, you can do it now. <laughs> you don't have to learn, you just do it. So there you go. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in, guys. Um, I'll be back at some point. I don't schedule anymore. I'm a renegade. <laughs> but I'll be back at some point soon. Have a lovely day. Um, I hope you're well, and if you're not well right now, I hope you're okay, and I hope you get better soon. Okay, peace.